Welcome to this predicted paper from OnMaths that is based on the advanced information given to us by the exam boards. Please use this paper in addition to your other revision. You can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our OnMaths site. OnMaths is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams, such as topic-based papers, demon questions and mini-mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing. Just like when you're simplifying fractions, you can't have decimals at the top and bottom. You can't have decimals at the top, uh, at the left and right of a ratio. So we're going to have to um, get rid of this decimal. And the way we're going to do that is just simply times each side by 10. And that will leave 4 and that will be 60. Now we need, can simplify this further because I can divide left and right by 2. So that would be 2 to 30. And I can actually do the same again. I can divide them by 2 again. And that would be 1 to 15. Now you might have just divided by 4. And that would also give you the right answer. In fact, there's a couple of different methods that you can get the same answer with. So we've got to first of all find out what the gradient is for our graph. So we're just going to pick two points and draw a triangle between them. So I'm just going to pick this point here and this point here. And there's no reason I pick those. I just pick those at random. And we look at how far it's going to cross. So it's gone across 10. And how far it's gone up. So it's gone from 24 to 36. So it's gone 12 up. And to work out the gradient, which you can call n, or you can just write out the word gradient, it's change in y over change in x. So how much has y changed over how much has x changed? So y is this one here, so it's changed by 12, and x has changed by 10. So it's 12 divided by 10, which is 1.2. Now a gradient represents the amount of change in the y per one change in the x. So for every one mile we travel, we're gonna go up, it's gonna cost 1.2 more. So, the interpretation that we give for this context, because this is about taxis, is that the taxi will cost £1.20 or 120 pence per one unit on the X per mile. And that's true for the gradient for any context. It's for every one of this how much of this increases, how much the y increases by. So to simplify 10 to 22 to 26, I'm going to have to find something that I can divide the 10, the 22 and the 26 by. The biggest number I can do that for is 2. So if you look, uh, 10 can be divided by 5, but nothing else can. 22 can be divided by 11, but nothing else can. And 26 by 13, but nothing else can. The only thing we can divide all of them by is 2. So that will be 5 to 11 to 13. So the answer is 5 to 11 to 13. So we need to first of all work out the amount of machine minutes it takes to make a toy. And what we do is we multiply the amount of machines by the amount of minutes. So 5 times 40 would be 200. So if we had one machine, it would take 200 minutes to um, create one toy. Here we asked, well, okay, what if we wanted a, a toy every eight minutes? So we get the 200 and we divide it by eight. And when we do that, we get 25. So if we had 25 machines, we would be able to make it every eight minutes. And the logic here is five machines so this is machines and this is minutes is 40 then fifth uh, then eight minutes if you think about it we divide that by five to get to eight and so if we divide the amount of minutes by five we actually times the amount of machines required by five so this is called an inverse relationship so if one doubles the other halves if one divided by five the other wall times by five. So our answer here is 25 machines. So the symbol here basically means and. 
And the way I remember it is if you draw that symbol and just put a line through it, you can make the word and. So we're looking at the probability of getting something that is in A and C. So the only ones that are in A and C are this 8 and this 9 here. So we're going to just add the 8 and the 9 together, which give us 17. Now we need to then work out how many numbers there are in total. So that's all of them. So 4 plus 8 plus 9 plus 5 plus 8 plus 3 plus 11 plus 6. So we need the total, which is 54. And then we get the 17. And we put that over the amount in total, so over 54. First thing I'm going to do is just draw the square out. And we know the length of it is 10x plus 10, but it is a square, so that's the same all the way around it. But we're also told that the perimeter is 440, so the perimeter is 440. So what we can do is we can work out the perimeter in algebra by multiplying 10x plus 10 by 4, or just adding up the four lengths that we've got. So we're going to do 4 times 10x plus 10. But we also know that that is going to be 440, because we're told in the question that the perimeter is 440. So put our lines in, because we're going to solve. And we're just going to start by expanding the brackets. So that will be 40x plus 40 equals 440. Then we're going to get rid of the plus 40 first, so take away 40 both sides. And so that would be 40x equals 400. And then we get rid of the 40 before the x, so we divide both sides by 40. And we've got x equals 10. So our answer is 10. So in this question we basically need to add the 2 and 3 quarters and the 2 and 2 fifths. So we're going to do 2 and 3 quarters plus 2 and 2 fifths. Now if I just rewrite this, 2 and 3 quarters can be written as 2 plus 3 quarters plus 2 plus 2 and a fifth or 2 fifths. So we can add the two twos together to make 4 and then all we need to do is add the 3 quarters and the 2 fifths. So when you add uh, two numbers with different denominators, what we need to do is get the common denominators. And we do that by just quickly writing out the 4 and the 5 times table and seeing what the first number in both the times tables is. 16, 20, and 5, 10, 15, 20. So that's 20. So we need to get the um, bottoms of the fractions to 20. Now for 3 quarters... To get the bottom to equal 20, we need to times the 4 by 5. And whatever you do to the bottom, you've got to do to the top. So times that by 5 as well, which will be 15. And for 2 fifths, we'll get that bottom to 20. So we times that by 4. And so we've got times the top by 4 as well to make it 8. So it's going to be 15 over 20 plus 8 over 20. So we need to add the uh, numerators. So it would be 15 plus 8, which is going to be 23 over 20. Now that is a top-heavy fraction, so we can rewrite that as 1 and 3 twentieths. And we can add the 4 and the 1 together to make 5 and 3 twentieths. So the answer is 5 and 3 twentieths. When we multiply numbers, it doesn't actually matter which order we multiply them. So I can actually rewrite this as 7 times 9 times 10 to the power of 2 times 10 to the power of 9. 7 times 9 is 63. And 10 to the power of 2 times 10 to the power of 9, we add the powers, so it would be 10 to the power of 11. Now here we've got a problem. It looks like standard form, but it is not standard form. Because standard form has to be a number between 1 and 10, but not including 10. And here we've got 63. So what I'm going to do is just quickly write out what this, what number this is. So we've got the decimal point here. And you don't need to do this, but I find it a bit easier to show what we're doing. 
So here we've got 10 to the power of 11. So it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. We fill these all out with zeros, and that's the number we've created here. A lot of zeros. Now, to make it a number between one and um, not one and ten, not including ten, the decimal point it needs to be here. So, we want that to end up with six point three times ten to the power of. Well, let's work that out now. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12. So it's going to be 10 to the power of 12. Now you don't need to do all the working out I've just shown there. Um, you just need to know when you convert that 63 into a 6.3, you need to add 1 to the power. So this question uh, will probably need a Venn diagram just to make it a bit easier. So I'm going to draw a Venn diagram. You don't need to. If you can work out how to do this question without, um, you can do. But I think this is a really tricky question to do without a Venn diagram. So it says um, that they picked two activities. It was either painting, which I'll put as a P, and sport, which I'll put as an S. So let's start filling in the information it gives us. So 11 picked painting and sport. So that will go in the middle, because that is painting and sport. And 11 didn't pick painting or sport, so they can sit on the outside. Now here's the problem. It says twice as many people picked sport than painting as one of their activities. So it's saying that the number, the total number in, and let's just show it, the total number in the sports circle is twice as big as the total number in the painting circle. Now, that what we can do is we can say, okay, so if the painting we label as x, then the sport will be 2x. But if you look, we've already got a number already in the sport, that 11 there. So in algebra, this will be 2x take away the 11 that we already know about. And the painting is the same. We know the whole thing is x. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take away the bit we know there, which is the 11, and it will be x minus 11. Now we know that there are 66 students in total. So what we can do now is add up all of the parts of the Venn diagram and get it equal to 66. So x minus 11 plus 11 plus 2x minus 11 plus 11, and all of that will equal 66. This is going to be some solving, so we're just going to put our lines in. Now here we've got x plus 2x, which is 3x. And if I my tool right there we are and we've got minus 11 plus 11 minus 11 plus 11 well those just cancel out so we're left with just the 3x equals and then 66 i'm going to divide that three both sides so we've got x equals 22. so if we go back to our venn diagram now we can fill in the, the blanks so instead of x minus 11 there, we've got 22 take away 11, which is just 11. Instead of 2x minus 11 there, we've got 22 times 2, which is 44 take away 11, which will be 33. So it says, uh, find the amount that picked sport and not painting, which is this 33 here. First thing we notice is that there is a square here. So we can work out what this length is going to be. It's also going to be 40 centimeters. And whenever we're working out the um, area of a shaded area, we're normally working out the area of two shapes and subtracting one from the other. And this question's really no different. Um, so we're going to start off working out the um, area of the square. And all we need to do now for that is 40 times 40. Uh, which will be 1,600 uh, centimetres squared. I normally only put units in our answer. The next thing we're going to do is work out the area of the circle, but to do that, we need to work out um, what the diameter of the circle is. And if you notice, that the diameter of the circle is just 40 degrees. It's the same as the width of the square, or height of the square.
So uh, if the diameter is 40 degrees, the radius would be 20 degrees. So for the circle, for the area of the circle, we're going to do pi times the radius, which is 20 squared. And 20 squared would be 400, so this will be 400 pi. This question's asking us to leave it in terms of pi, so we're going to do that. Now, next we're going to work out the um, all of the corners, so that includes these three here and this one. Uh, so I'll say, like, I don't know, four corners. Just try and explain to the person marking my exam what I'm doing. And to do that, we're just going to do the square, take away the circle. So 1,600, take away 400 pi. Now, we can't actually um, do anything more than that. That is our answer. Um, so it's just we just leave it at that. And to work out just the shaded bit, which is this bit here, they are four equal amounts that we've got for these corners. So just one corner, which is the shaded bit, will be the four corners divided by four. Now we've got a kind of fraction here. We can divide all of the terms by four. So that will leave one at the bottom, one, 100 pi here. And this will be 1,600 divided by four is 400. So we're just cancelling the fraction and actually we leave it as 400 minus 100 pi. And that indeed is our answer. You can't simplify that any further. So we've got to first of all understand what standard form is. And standard form is a number that is between 1 and 10, but not including 10, times 10 to the power of another number. So to find out what the number is going to be for our standard form, we're going to just write down the decimal first. 0 0.098 and we've got to put a decimal point in somewhere to make this a number between 1 and 10 so if I put it in here that would make it 9.8 and we're ignoring the, the, the zeros to the left hand side so we know that our standard form is going to start off with 9.8 times 10 to the power of something now this times 10 is always going to be there it's never divided by 10 or anything like that it's always times 10 Next, we've got to find out what the power is going to be. So, first of all, if it's a small number, if it's a number less than 1, which this is, it's a small number, it's going to be a negative power. And the next thing we do is work out how many jumps we have to do. So it would be 1, 2 jumps between where the decimal point was and where it is now. So 2 jumps means it's going to be to the power of minus 2. So to do a cumulative frequency graph, we've got to first of all add a cumulative frequency column to our table. And cumulative frequency is just a running total. So we always start off with the first value, which is 10. Then we add the next value. So 10 plus 25 is 35. Then we add the next value. So that's going to be 50. Now, the cumulative frequency is the total amount so far. So, for that first 10, for the frequency of cumulative frequency of 10, we're looking at everything up until the 20. So, we plot it at the 20. So, it'd be 20 and then 10. So, this one here. Then the next one, the 35, is everything up until 40. So, it would be here. And then the next one is everything up until 60. There we are. Now, next, we want to join them up. Now, you can draw them up with a curve, and in most exams, you can actually join them up with straight lines. So something you can do is just join them up with, oh, click the right one, straight lines like that. And in most exams, that's absolutely fine. I'm going to join them up with um, a curve. There we go. Now, technically, I should really finish this off um, with a nice straight bit there because there's just a constant 50 forevermore. I'm going to start by just drawing the line y equals minus 2. So the line y equals minus 2 will be a horizontal line at minus 2, which will be 
down here. Next, we're going to do the line x equals minus 1. And that will be a vertical line at minus 1. Now, here's a bit of a problem. We've got no equal to underneath it. And whenever we don't have an equal to, we do a dash line. So we're going to do a dash line here. OK, the last graph is a little bit harder. We've got y is, or I'm going to do y equals x minus 3. And it's going to be perfectly diagonal line, but down to minus 3. So it's going to be this line here, uh, about there. But it's, it's going to be dashed because we don't have an equal to. So... It's going to be a dashed line like that. So if they have an equal to underneath, then it will be um, a solid line. If they don't have an equal to underneath, it will be a dashed line. OK, now we've got to work out where the region is. So we've drawn the lines, uh, and the lines are either dashed or solid, and so they're perfect, but we've got to work out where the region is. So we can see on the first one that y is greater than or equal to minus 2. So it's going to be above this line. Okay. You can see on the next one that x is greater than uh, minus 1, so it's going to be this side. So we've already narrowed it down to somewhere in this region here. And here we're given that y is greater than x minus 3. So what we do here is we pick a point. So I'm going to pick a coordinate, and I'm going to pick 0, 0. 0, 0 is always my go-to one. Write out the equation, and I'm just going to put a box here. So x minus 3, and fill in the uh, coordinates for 0, 0. So 0, blank, 0, minus 3, 0, blank, 0, take away 3 is minus 3. So what is 0 compared to minus 3? Well, 0 is greater than minus 3. And therefore, this coordinate is on the correct side, because if we look, we've got y is greater than x minus 3 is our region that we're looking for. So we're looking for that. That's good. And so our region will be anywhere in this bit here. Anywhere at all. And you're asked normally to <coughs> mark it with an R. <coughs> I'm kind of colouring it in just because your r can be anywhere within this region it can actually be at zero zero anywhere within the yellow region would give you the mark to find the distance or displacement on a velocity time graph we're actually going to find the area underneath the graph and to do that we're going to split the graph into two and we've got the um, trapezium on the left hand side and we've got this rectangle on the right hand side so to work out the area of the trapezium, we're going to do half A plus B times the height. And the two parallel sides are on the left and the right. So it's going to be half times um, this part here, which is 40, plus this point here, which is 160. And then the height is actually the width. So the height is this bit here, so that's going to be times 2. Those will cancel out, the half and the times 2, so that would be 200. And uh, similarly, to work out the area of B, it's just length, uh, width times length. So that's going to be uh, 3 wide. And again, 160 tall. So 3 times 160, which would be 480. And so we need to work out the total area. And we do that just by adding the two together. So 200 plus 480, which will be 680. When asked to simplify a fraction, we need to find a factor at the top and the bottom of the fraction to divide out. 
So we're going to start by factorizing these fractions and I'm not going to go into how to factorize quadratics um, because we've got plenty of other videos on the site that go into that. But when you factorize the top you get 3x plus 4 and x minus 5 and when you factorize the bottom you get 2x minus 1 and x minus 5. Now it's not a coincidence we have the x minus 5 at the top and the x minus 5 at the bottom because we're just going to divide that out to simplify the fraction. So we're just going to divide that out, that will make that uh, convert it into 1 and 3x plus 4 times 1 is just 3x plus 4 and same with the bottom. So we end up with 3x plus 4 at the top and 2x minus 1 at the bottom. So the first thing to do is we want to find the roots from the sketch that we've got and the roots are just where the graph crosses the x-axis so we can see it crosses it here at minus 8 crosses it here at 3 crosses it here at 5 now what is special about roots? well roots are where the graph equals 0 it's where y is 0 and the only way to get to 0 is for looking at this is if one of these brackets is 0. So we're going to say, OK, well, let's have a look at the first one, x plus a. Let's get that equal to 0. Oh, equal to 0. Um, so we're going to put in the first root in there. We're going to say minus 8 plus a equals 0. Add 8 both sides. a must equal 8. So if a equals 8, then the whole thing will equal 0. That's the first root done. Could do the same with the next one, x plus b equals 0, and this time um, the root is 3, so it's going to be 3 plus b equals 0. Take away 3 both sides, and you get b is minus 3. Then we're looking at the last one, x plus c. Look at the last root, which is 5. Ooh, we're going to get it equal to 0, and then it's going to be 5 plus c equals 0. And take away 5 both sides, you get minus 5. And so if a is 8, b is minus 3, and c is minus 5, it means that at minus 8, 3, and 5, it will equal 0, which is what it does in our graph. Now you might say, well, why does a have to be equal 8? Why can't b equal 8? It can. These can be in any order. And so if I wrote these in the opposite order, minus 5, uh, 8, and minus 3, for instance, it would still be correct. So I'm going to, first of all, just draw out the diagram a bit bigger, just so we've got a bit more space. And we're looking at going from B to M, and M is about here. Now the first thing to notice with M, and I'm just going to quickly label the other parts on, is that the ratio of A to M is 1, and M to C is 4. So the ratio is 1 to 4 between the two. And what is really helpful sometimes is just to label in the kind of sections. So if A to M is one section, we've got four of the sections from M to C. So just put like notches there to show the four sections. And we can see straight away that A to M is one-fifth of that distance. And that's why it's a nice, easy way to show that A to M is one-fifth of that distance. Let's just put a nicer five. There we go. And so we're looking at going from B to M, but we can't go directly from B to M. We've got to go from B to A to M, and that's going to be the direction of travel. Now, we don't know the name of the road um, between A and M. In fact, we don't know the name of the road between A and C. We've got to first of all work out what that's called. So what we're going to do is we're going to go from A to C by going down here and then up here. So we can find out A to C is going to be going backwards down A, then up B. Now A to M is going to be one-fifth of A to C. Now if A to C is minus A plus B, that means A to M is going to be minus one-fifth A plus one-fifth B. Now we're asked for um, the vector B to M. And we know that that's going to be B to A plus A to M. We 
We know B to A, because it's labelled, it's just A. And we know A to M, because we've worked it out down here. And it should be minus, let's get rid of that, because we know it's going to be minus one-fifth A plus one-fifth B. And so A minus one-fifth A is going to be four-fifths A. And then we've got the one-fifth B. So it's going to be four-fifths A plus one-fifth B. You can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our OnMath site. OnMath is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams, such as topic-based papers, demon questions, and mini-mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing.